My name is Clayton King. I've been here before to preach for Pastor David and for your students at Youth Crusade. Always good to come back to you good folks at Long Hollow. I live in North Carolina, so I am your neighbor to the east, and I know that some of you think that Tennessee is better, and in many ways you are. You're better, and I said amen. God's already moving in this service. <laughs> but I just want you to know that you may, you may have better barbecue, but we have better basketball. That's all I got to say. That's all I got to say. So um, listen, I want you to do a favor for me. Turn to your neighbor right now. Just pick a neighbor. I don't care who it is. Just pick somebody. Pick a neighbor. Turn to him. Look at him. Everybody has to do this. God's watching you. Do it. Pick a neighbor and say this. You better get ready to listen to Clayton King because he's preaching to you and you need to hear it. All right. Very good. Very good. I've only got two and a half hours to get to work, so let's go ahead and start today. It's really good to be back. Pastor David's one of my, one of my very uh, best friends. I, I honor him and respect him so much. Love this church. Love to be able to come and preach for you. I'm an evangelist. I'm also the campus pastor at Liberty University in Virginia. I'm the teaching pastor at a church called New Spring in South Carolina. And I'm married to the greatest woman in the world. I've got two little boys, Jacob and Joseph. And I may tell you a little bit about them. We live near Charlotte. And it's just really good to be here today. Get your Bibles and turn to Luke 24. In the words of the great old worship song, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. We're going to do what they say can't be done. Somebody in here had to watch Smokey and the Bandit. Okay, we're going to look today at a passage of Scripture that is one of my favorites. Sometimes in your life and mine, we, we miss things that are right there in front of us. Things that we should notice, things that we should see, things that are powerful and life-changing. We don't even recognize them, sometimes just because we're too busy or sometimes because we have other things on our mind. And I want to kind of open this up with a true story that happened to me in college. I went to a, a small Christian college in North Carolina and Played ball with a guy there, a good friend of mine. I went on to be an evangelist. He went on to be a youth pastor in Savannah at a Methodist church. And about 10 years ago, he brought me in to speak at a big youth event. And he picked me up at the airport. And he knows how much I love barbecue. And if you're a Christian, so do you. Because, <laughs> because there's nothing wrong with this world that a little dead pig or dead cow can't fix. And so he knew that I loved barbecue. And when he picked me up at the airport, he said, hey, I know barbecue is your favorite food, but I want to take you and treat you to my favorite food. And I said, what is it? He said, sushi. I said, no, in Jesus' name, get thee behind me, Satan. I do not eat that kind of fish. I use that kind of fish as bait for other fish that I can then kill and deep fry. And he knew me, we played ball together, so he knew me, and all he had to say to me, which works for a lot of guys, is, what's wrong? Are you scared? And I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I am only scared of three things in this world. I'm not scared of sushi. I'm only scared of three things, math, cats, and clowns. That's all I'm afraid of. <laughs> math, because it's a tool of Satan to destroy the universe. Cats, because they are evil. And, and clowns because they eat children. It's true. I saw it on the Discovery Channel one time. I'm telling you, clowns eat children. So he appealed to my manliness. We went to eat sushi. I said, how do I do this? I don't know what's going on here. He said, just trust me. When a friend takes you to eat sushi and says, just trust me, be aware. He said, I'll order for you. We ordered, we sat down. There's, you know, little, little balls of things on there with rice then there's soy sauce. He poured some in a little th container. And then there's a gigantic ball of green goo. So I said, what's the green stuff? He said, wasabi sauce. I said, what's it taste like? He said, that's the best part. I said, so how do I do this? He said, take one of these rolls. It's called the California roll. Dip it in a little soy sauce. Then take that entire green ball. <laughs> yep, this guy worshiped the devil, didn't he? Put it on top of your piece of sushi and then just eat it. I said, the whole thing? He said, the whole thing. Put the whole thing in your mouth and then, and then begin to chew and then breathe through your nose. <laughs> I, I did as I was told. And I'm telling you, I saw Julie Andrews on the top of a mountain singing, the hills are alive with the sound of music. The world opened up to me, sirens, bells, whistles. My head began to sweat. I, the Lord took me to the third heaven like the Apostle Paul. 
and I have been eating sushi ever since then. Raise your hand if you've ever had sushi. Keep your hand up if you love it. The rest of y'all are like, these people need to give their lives to Jesus. <laughs> he knew something I didn't know. He had experienced something I had never experienced. That's my sushi story. But for some of you, that's your Jesus story. You have heard people tell you how good Jesus is. You have been maybe even raised in a culture where people talk about how good it is to know the Lord. You've got friends that pray for you, that invite you to church, that send you text messages that tell you they're thinking about you today. You get messages on Facebook inviting you to come to church. And some of you maybe even were raised in a, you know, you're raised in a Christian home and your mom was a Christian, a Sunday school teacher maybe. Your dad was a deacon. Maybe your grandpa or uncle was a pastor. If you've lived in the South for any number of years or if you're from the South, you've probably been exposed in some way, shape, or form to the gospel or to the religion of Christianity or to a preacher on TV. I mean, come on, y'all. This is the greater Nashville area. From my hotel to Long Hollow today, I passed seven churches. You can be so close to something so good and still miss it. And my sushi story for some of you is indicative of your Jesus story. You've heard about him, you've seen him, you've been around him, but you have not yet experienced him for yourself. You're not the only one that that's happened to. In Luke 24, we see two men that had a very similar situation take place in their life. I'm gonna set this up for you. Jesus has just been raised from the dead. It's Sunday morning, and they go to the tomb to see if his body is there, and the women find him disappeared. The angels tell them that he's not here. He has risen as he promised. The women go back and tell the disciples, Jesus' body is gone. The disciples run to the tomb. They see that the tomb is empty. And then this starts a, a domino effect of a series of events where Jesus for 40 days is on the earth. He appears to many people, over 500 at one time. And then Jesus eventually ascends back into heaven. The church begins. The gospel spreads around the world. 2,000 years later, we're reading this story. And this story is about two men who were so close to Jesus but didn't recognize him. Look at verse 20, chapter 24, verse 13. It'll be up on the screens as well. Now that time, on that same day, two men were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Isn't that amazing? They're talking about Jesus, and Jesus appears, walks along with them, and they don't even know it's him. One of my best friends in the world just spoke at a conference in Australia for Hillsong Church. He was backstage after he preached, and he's meeting people in the green room backstage after he just preached at Hillsong for Pastor Brian Houston. And someone introduced him, and they said, hey, this is Carrie. And so my friend shook hands with this girl named Carrie. And after the night was over, about an hour later, someone looked to my friend. His name is Stephen. They said, wow, wasn't it amazing that you got to meet Carrie Underwood? He said, when did I meet Carrie Underwood? They said, just about an hour ago, I introduced you to her in the green room. He, he was so focused on the sermon that he didn't even realize he had just met country superstar Carrie Underwood. That's what happens to these guys, except that this isn't a country superstar. This is the king of the universe. And they don't even realize that it's Jesus, and they're talking about him. And what happens next is really cool. Verse 17, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? That's a silly question. Jesus knew what they were talking about. Jesus knows everything. You can't fool God. God reads your thoughts. God hears your words. God knows the intention of your heart. God knows everything. You can't fool God. When God asks a question, he's not asking it because he is deficient in knowledge. When Jesus asks a question, he's always asking it for our sake, not for his. So Jesus is just kind of playing dumb here. He's leading these guys along. And he's not, he's not doing it to be mean. There's a purpose to what Christ is doing here. They respond. They stood still, their faces downcast, verse 18. One of them named Cleopas asked Jesus, now listen to the sarcasm 
in this question. Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus replies, what things? I love that. Jesus acts as if he doesn't know what's going on, but it was always his plan to meet these guys because he wanted them to see him for who he really was. So the Bible says in verse 18 and 19, they respond, things about Jesus of Nazareth. And then they preach the gospel to Jesus. They tell the story of Jesus to Jesus. They preach the gospel to the one who was the gospel, and they have no idea. I love the irony and the humor of this story. They they tell him everything. They say in verse 19, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's today. Today is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came out and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just like the women had said, but him they did not see. So they have not personally met Jesus yet. They have not personally been to the tomb yet. And they're telling Jesus the story of his own resurrection, and they don't even realize that they are standing right there in front of Jesus. What's the point to all this? Why am I preaching on this? Because for some of you, Jesus has been so close to you for so long, you haven't even recognized him, you haven't even seen him, and he has been working behind the scenes in your life with his unseen hand of providence and provision, and he has done all those things in your life, the good things, the bad things, the tragedies, the disappointments, the depression, the discouragement, the loss, the the disease, the death of family members, maybe even the divorce, the hard things in your life, an unseen hand of God's providence has been in the background of your life working in the shadows so that you can have an Emmaus moment just like these two guys are about to have. Listen to me, people. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I want you to know this. There is no coincidence with God. Nothing is random. Nothing is wasted. God is superintending the events of the universe not to hurt you, but to help you, not to take something from you, but to give something to you. And I'm about to get lathered up here because I'm 90% Baptist and 10% Pentecostal, and that is a very dangerous mixture. I am living out what I believe. I am smoking what I'm selling to y'all today, if you catch my drift. I have seen this in my life played out for 26 years when we are totally clueless to what God's doing. He's still doing it. To bring us to a point. I'm sorry I'm getting fired. No, I'm not sorry I'm getting fired up. Good Lord. This is better than the Super Bowl. Plus the Titans aren't in it anyway, so who cares, right? This is better than who wins next Sunday. Jesus is up to something in your life. And just because you haven't seen it yet doesn't mean you won't see it now. I need to move on. Jesus says in verse 25, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the things The prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And from that point, I love this. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is unbelievable. This is is incredulous. They're looking for Jesus. They're talking about Jesus. Jesus appears to them. They don't know it's Jesus. They preach the gospel of Jesus to Jesus. They're talking about the resurrection of Jesus to the one who has just been raised from the dead. And then Jesus Christ, the word of God, starts to explain to them the book that he wrote. And he goes from the prophets all the way up to that day. And he unveils the whole story of the gospel. And then something really awesome happens after that. Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, the village is called Emmaus. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem. It would have taken an average man somewhere between four, five, maybe six hours if they were walking slow. Four to five hours would have been the journey. 
So Jesus has been walking along with these men for maybe four or five hours. They are blown away by his wisdom. They are amazed by the way that he knows the scriptures. They see something in Jesus that makes their hearts burn within their chest. They are enthralled with him. And so when they get to their village, it's probably getting dark. In those days, no one traveled alone after dark on foot. No one would dare risk their lives. There were bandits and robbers and thieves. The story of the Good Samaritan bears that out. We know that, that nobody would travel alone for fear of losing their own life or being robbed or beaten up. And so as was the custom in the days of Christ during the first century in the second temple period, they practiced Middle Eastern hospitality. They invite Jesus into their home. Don't miss this symbolism. Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. He's setting this whole thing up. And instead of him going farther, they urged him strongly, verse 29, stay with us because it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. Now, I'd like to, I'd like to make this practical for you. This is more than just a Sunday school story. This has a meaning for your life. Do you realize that when Jesus is invited in, he always says yes? Jesus is invited into their home, and he doesn't deny them. When we ask Jesus to come in, he'll come. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans 10, 13 says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. That means if you're old and you feel like you've wasted your life, if you call on the name of the Lord, he'll save you even at old age and your life will not be wasted. That means if you're a teenager and you're just getting started with life and the rest of your future lies ahead of you and everything is, is wonderful and awesome and you've got so many opportunities and you give your life to Christ as a 14-year-old like I did when I was in the eighth grade, if you ask him to come in, he will come in. There are no prerequisites. All you have to do is ask. You don't clean yourself up before you come to Jesus. You don't rehabilitate yourself before you come to Jesus. That would be like taking a bath before taking a shower. It's redundant. It's useless. We come to Jesus just like we are, and when we say, here I am, Lord, he says, I'll take you just like you are, but I'm not going to leave you like you are. Jesus loves us just like we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. They invite Jesus in. He comes in. And just like they would always do for any guest in that day and time, I've visited you know, the Middle East multiple times. I've led two trips to, to Israel, one recently for our campus at Liberty University. They still do this in this part of the world, in Jordan, even in Syria, which is being ripped apart by civil war right now. This still takes place. When a guest comes into the home, they are treated as if they were the president, the prince, or the prime minister. So they prepare a meal. Jesus is, Jesus is risen from the dead, but he is still personally involved in people's lives. Jesus is risen from the dead, but he still cares enough about people to be personally relatable to them. So they bring Jesus into their home. They cook a meal. And it says in verse 30, when Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And as a matter of fact, it changed them so much. It says in verse 33, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. It's dark. They've got to walk seven miles back to town on foot. They got up at once, went back to Jerusalem in the dark, a dangerous road at night, probably arrived there after midnight, and they found the 11 and those that were assembled with them together, and they said, it's true. The Lord is risen, and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. I'd like to just point your attention to a few very simple truths out of this scripture. Number one, you might want to write this down. Number one, just because you talk about Jesus doesn't mean you know Jesus. Just because you talk about Jesus doesn't mean you see Jesus. Just because we talk about Jesus doesn't mean we recognize him. Now, I went to a Baptist college. I told you guys I'm part Baptist, part Pentecostal, and part Presbyterian. Went to a Baptist church growing up, went to a Presbyterian Christian school, and my grandfather was Pentecostal. So I'm Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal. Y'all know what that means, right? That means I was predestined to speak in tongues while eating fried chicken at a deacon's meeting. <laughs> Come on, people, that's funny. I don't care who you are, that is funny. Give me a courtesy laugh. 
Okay, apparently y'all are used to giving courtesy laughs at David's jokes too, right? So you're used to that. So, so, so I grew up in a religious culture. I got saved when I was 14. I was in college my freshman year. Late one night in the dorms, me and some of my freshman friends who didn't know anything about theology invited some of the senior guys who were majoring in theology to come and hang out with us. And we began debating. Now, I, this was all new to me. We stayed up till 2 in the morning. There, people kept coming into our dorm room. A football player ended up showing up, pastoral majors. And these senior guys are talking about predestination and premillennial dispensational millennialism and, and uh, the sovereignty of God and once saved, always saved, and eternal security. And what about those who have never heard? And, and using big, huge theological terms. And, and I was just kind of lost. And people are debating and arguing, do we really have free will? Uh, what about the spirit? Spiritual gifts, are they all still in, in, in use today? And, and we, were, we had talked for hours. And finally, one of the guys, a football player, he was a brand new believer. He did not know anything about being polite. He just speaks up. He goes, I got a question. Why have we just spent all this time talking about Jesus when I know for a fact some of y'all don't ever tell anybody about him? He said, this is a waste of my time. I'm leaving. And I will never forget the impression that made on me. We can talk about Jesus and not know him. We can talk about Jesus. We can debate about Jesus. Hey, guys, ladies, you know you can come to church on Sunday, and when the music is good and the band is on, raise your hands, praise the Lord, sing along. Did you know that I was raised in a Christian home, joined the church, and baptized when I was seven? I knew about Jesus in my head but did not know Jesus in my heart until a drug dealer at my high school was radically saved and his life was turned around by the grace of God? Do you know that going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a Big Mac? Do you realize that we can do all the religious things? We can grow up in a, in a religious culture. We can attend church. But we can be just like these two guys. We can be all around the things of God without letting the gospel of Christ penetrate our hearts. These men had their hearts absolutely cracked wide open by the grace of God so that at the end they say, how our hearts burn within us when he talked to us about, about the scriptures. I don't want you to go through life talking about Jesus. I want you to know him. It's like the sushi story. I mean, it's a dumb example, but I didn't know how good it was until I tried it for myself. I didn't know how beautiful the Grand Canyon was just by looking at pictures in books and magazines. But in 1994, when I saw it for the first time with these two eyes, it took my breath away. I didn't know what a wonderful joy it was to, to be married until I said I do. I didn't understand. Everybody told me how wonderful it was to be a dad. But until I watched my child born, until I held that baby in my arms, I never knew what it would do to my heart. I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's okay to talk about Jesus, but don't just settle for that because that's not nearly as good as the real thing. Experience him for yourself. Know him for yourself. Give your life to him. And you'll understand why so many people Talk about him all the time. You'll understand why we give our money to his church. You'll understand why we sing, why we close our eyes and lift our hands to a God we can't see. All of those things, skeptics and critics and, and cynics, just like I was, all those things look really strange and weird until you've met the man himself. Number two, if you're really looking for Jesus, he will show himself to you. If you're really looking for Jesus... If you really are open to truth, if you really are open-minded about religious things, if you really want to know the truth, no matter where the truth takes you, if you are willing to say, I want to know the truth because if there is a God, if Jesus really is the Son of God, if he really is raised from the dead, if there really is a heaven, if there really is a hell, if Jesus really is the only way to God, if that's true, then I want to know it. If you want to know the truth, Jesus Christ will reveal himself to you. He does not hide himself from us for very long. I got, there are so many stories I could tell you guys about this. I, I, I've been to the Himalayas several times on backpacking treks. We've taken the gospel to these unreached people groups way up in the mountains that nobody's ever been to. And one of my favorite stories, and I, and I, and I heard it firsthand, I was not on this backpacking trek, but one of my friends, an American doctor from Louisiana, had backpacked into a village in the Marka Valley, and it's on the border of, 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 the, uh, of Kashmir, 
Missionaries had never gone there before. And she was going to take a team with medicine and Bibles and backpacks, and they were going to walk miles and miles and miles to, this, to these unreached uh, people groups in these villages. And when she arrived in the village they were trying to reach, she had altitude sickness, and she told me that she was very sick, and she was actually vomiting, and her head was, was splitting with a terrible headache. And she said, I was hanging my head over a rock wall, throwing up in my mind, praying, Lord, please prepare the hearts of these people. They've never heard the gospel. And she said, while I was sick, hanging my head over a rock wall, a Tibetan Buddhist monk from that village walks up behind me and in broken English says, you're a visitor. Are you the one who has come to tell us about Jesus? She said, I stood up and I looked at him and I said, yes. Has someone already come to tell you about Jesus? He said, no. She said, then how do you know his name? And the man said, the Tibetan Buddhist monk who had never, ever been more than 10 or 15 miles away from that village in the Himalayan mountains said to her, for years, a man named Jesus has been appearing to me in my dreams at night since I was a little boy telling me one day someone will come, a visitor, they will bring a book that book will tell you about me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The man said, did you bring the book and are you the one I've been waiting for? When you are looking for Jesus, he'll reveal himself to you. He will. He will not withhold his grace. He loves you. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to help you. He doesn't want to take anything from you except your sin. The only thing Jesus wants from you and me is our sin. That's what he wants. He wants to take your sin away from you before it kills you. But number three, no matter how close Jesus is, you're still blind if you don't open your eyes. No matter how close Jesus gets to you, no matter how many preachers he sends to your life, no matter how many friends invite you to church, no matter how many songs you hear on the radio, no matter how many moments when you feel his presence pulling you, no matter how many times God will in his grace reveal the love of Jesus Christ to you, you will remain blind if you do not open your eyes and choose to believe. Can I just point out something to you? Right here, right now, in this very moment, there are lots of things going on around the world, but guess where you're at? You're in a great big building in Hendersonville, Tennessee, listening to a guy from North Carolina read to you a story from the Bible and tell you that God loves you. You're right here right now for whatever circumstances or scenarios that led you here. Do you really think for one skinny minute it is an accident that the power of God through whatever circumstances he had to employ to superimpose his will? Do you think for one second it's a coincidence or a random act that you wound up here today with me telling you that there is a God? His name is Jesus. He loves you. He died for you. He wants to save you. He is for you, not against you. If nothing else in you your life has ever happened to show you that God loves you, it's happening right now. Look where you're at. Look what I'm doing. I'm, you may not even believe it, but you better believe I believe it. And maybe that's enough to get you to believe it, that Jesus can save you, that Jesus loves you, that Jesus died for you. Because sometimes we have a hard time believing that he's right here. We have a hard time believing that Jesus is right here. I can touch him. I can feel him because things in your life have been terrible. Listen, guys, I've lost my mom and dad both. My, I preached my mom's funeral a year and a half ago, and I preached my dad's funeral this year on Father's Day. I have gone through the deepest, darkest pit of depression and discouragement that I could ever have imagined I would go through in my life. And there have been days I did not want to get up out of bed. There have been days I could not, by my own flesh, even will myself to turn the lights on. But God never left me. He has been by my side. I've been preaching the gospel for 26 years, and I am not even immune to the things that happen in life. People die. Divorce happens. People get sick. Dreams are dashed against the rocks. Your life doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. You lose money. You lose jobs. Relationships fall apart. There is one thing that remains. And there is only one thing that we can put our hope in. And it's this, that God loves me. And he will not abandon me. And he will be with me. You may not believe that yet, but in the next five minutes, I believe that you will. And I better hope and pray that it's true. 
And how do I know it's true? Because it's been true ever since I put my faith in him. You may not believe it, but believe I believe it. And I don't mean to get fired up and I don't mean to rant and rave, but when you believe something as deep as I believe this, hey, if everybody in this room was dying of cancer and I had the cure, I would do whatever it took to get you to take the cure. Everybody in this room is dying of sin. And some of you have already received the cure, the grace of Jesus Christ. Some of you have not received it yet. I've received it. I don't want you to die of sin. I want Jesus to set you free from it. And this is the cure. Believe. But you've got to open your eyes. I don't care how close Jesus gets to you. You've got to open your eyes or you're still blind. What turned him around? What was the moment when they saw him? It was when he broke the bread. The Bible says that he broke the bread. In verse 31, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. I can't prove this. The Bible doesn't tell us what it was, but if you guys can just watch me for a minute, just look up here. I've got two hands. I use my hands to do all kinds of things, but the Bible says that Jesus took the bread and broke it. And the symbolism, as Luke records this story, is so rich. The bread of life, who three days earlier was broken for them, now sits at their supper table, resurrected in the flesh, breaking bread for them. The same God who gave his son to die on the cross for you and for me has now visited us today. He's in this house. We invited him in. We asked him to come, and he did, and he's here right now. And you know what he's doing? He's burning in your heart the same way that he was burning something into their hearts. And when Jesus broke that bread, I believe what opened their eyes and caused the scales to fall off, I believe they saw the scars on the back of his hands. We know he had scars. How do we know? Because he appeared to doubting Thomas when Thomas said, unless I can see the scars and touch his flesh, I'm not going to believe that Jesus is alive. And Jesus said, your wish is my command. Here you go, Thomas. Thrust your hands. Touch me. Feel me. Put your hands in the scars. I believe when Jesus, the bread of life that was broken on the cross for them, took the bread and broke it in their home, I believe the Spirit of God illuminated them and they saw the scars on the back of their hands and they said, my Lord and my God, he's been with us all day. And we didn't even see him. But we knew there was something special about him because our hearts burned within us. And I'm just wondering right now if some of you have felt that burning in your heart. And you realize today that Jesus has been closer to you than you ever imagined. Are you ready to do the same thing they did? When they saw Jesus, it changed them. And they began to tell everybody. It's time. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that everybody in this church building would open their hearts to you. And I pray, God, that no one would get up, no one would move, no one would leave. That in this holy moment, we would open our hearts to you wide and free. And that those who have never truly seen you would see you now. And that anyone who has never truly opened their eyes and received you by faith, that this would be the moment they open their eyes and their heart. With your eyes closed, but your heart open, I'm going to ask everybody in this auditorium, Right now, would you just simply be honest with the Lord? If you have never repented of your sin, if you have never trusted Jesus, if today, for the first time in your life, it makes sense, the light bulb has gone off. It, it now all comes together. And even though you don't have every answer, nobody does. You've seen enough of Jesus today to realize he's not just a historical figure. He is a person, and I can know him. It's not just a story it's the truth. So with your eyes closed, but your heart open, I don't care if you are a grandparent. I don't care if you are a little child. I don't care if you're a teenager or a dad or a mom. The gospel is for you. Jesus is for you. This story is for you. He has shown you who he is today. He has given you the light so you can see him. But now you have to open your eyes. Now you have to stop being blind. Now you have to invite him into your heart like these men invited Jesus into their home. Will you do that right now? 
If the Spirit of God is drawing you to Christ, if your heart has burned within you and you know that this moment is your moment to be saved, I want to invite you right now, not tomorrow or next week. It could be too late. Right now, give your life to Christ. Right now. I'm going to ask you to pray this to him right where you sit. It's not a magic prayer. I'm not a Catholic priest, so I'm not praying it for you. I'm asking you, invite Jesus into your life. Repent of your sins and be saved. So with your eyes closed but your hearts open, quietly in your seat right now, if you want to know Christ and begin a relationship with him, ask him, invite him in. Pray these words to Jesus right now if you really mean it. Right now, say this to Jesus in your heart. Jesus, I need you. Rescue me from my sin. I repent of my sin. And I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you control. Save me now, Jesus. I'm all in and I'm all yours. I see you now, Jesus, and I know you love me. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. Now with your eyes closed and your hearts open, I'm gonna ask this immediately, deliberately, without any shame or fear, If you just prayed that prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you right now with boldness to raise your hand straight up above your head. Straighten your elbow all the way out. Keep them up. Keep them up. Do not put them down. If you just prayed that prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ, raise your hand straight up above your head. Some of you got both hands up. That's what I'm talking about. Now I'm going to ask you, don't put your hands down. I'm going to ask you to do something bold, big, and important. I want you right now, without any shame, without any fear, without any hesitation, the floor and the balcony, if your hand is up because you have prayed to receive Christ, would you stand up on your feet right now? Go. Stand up on your feet right now. Old, young, female, male, rich, poor, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. You have met the living God in flesh and blood today in this house. Stand up on your feet. Stand up on your feet. Everybody look around. No secrets. Look around. Don't sit. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Don't sit. Look at this. Look at this. Glory to God. Now let me talk to you for a second. Don't sit down. Do not sit down. Prayer counselors, stand up with them. Prayer counselors, you know who you are, and we're going to need every one of you. Stand up with them. We don't have much time. You have just begun a relationship with the living God. You are brand new now, and I know you don't understand it, but you're going to walk in a brand new life with a brand new Lord, a brand new Savior, a brand new God. Here's what I'm going to ask every one of you that are standing to do from the balcony and on the floor. Everybody's looking at you, and we're rejoicing, okay? One more thing we want you to do, and I'm going to ask everybody to do this. Do not sit back down. We have people that are going to pray with you. Pastor Jeff is here at the front. If you need to talk to him and pray with him, we've also got prayer counselors. We want to help you. We're not going to give you a, we're not going to spam your email. We're not going to give you a tattoo backstage. Nothing like that. We want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. Every one of you, from the youngest to the oldest, from the balcony to the front row, I'm going to ask you to do something right now. Would you right now step out and walk right over here to your right? We have people to pray with you. Start right now. Come on. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Encourage them as they come. Come on. Come on. From the balcony. Come down. Come down. Come down. Let's go. Come on. Come on. From the balcony. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. We want to help you. Come on. Come on. Let's go. We're just going to pray with you. That's all we want to do. Come on. Come on. Just say excuse me. People will move. Let's go. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Just come on right now. Come on right now. All the way from the balcony. Come on, guys. Don't sit down. We want to help you. We want to give you a Bible. We want to make sure you can take the next step as a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Unbelievable. Come on, just make your way forward. Now, before we take our offering, we'll give them a minute to go. Some of you prayed to receive Christ. 
Some of you, uh, yeah, we're still coming from the balcony. Take your time, guys. We'll wait on you. There's no rush. Come on. Praise God. This is why Long Hollow Baptist Church exists, so that lost people can be found by the grace of God. Wow. Man. Now, I want to say this uh, before we take our offering. Some of you prayed to receive Christ and, and you didn't raise your hand or you didn't come forward. Listen, raising your hand does not make you a Christian. Walking forward does not save you. Jesus Christ saves you and only Jesus. So, whether you're young or old, whatever age, whatever demographic you come from, if you prayed to receive Christ today and for whatever reason you didn't come forward, it's okay. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean that you didn't mean the prayer. We are here for you. So if you received Christ today and you're still sitting out there in the audience, do this. Before this day is over, find somebody that works here at Long Hollow. Come and talk to Pastor Jeff. Come and talk to one of our staff members. Or if you've got a, a, a friend or a family member or a, someone that invited you, let somebody know today that you repented of your sins and you trusted Christ. We just want to help you begin the next steps because here's, here's the deal, guys. Jesus wants more than decisions. Jesus wants disciples. And so we're so thankful that you've been saved today, but it's our job as the church to help you become a fully functional disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the ushers to come on forward right now and to pray. We're going to take up our offering, and then Pastor Jeff's got some words for us. Lord, your salvation has blown our minds today. Satan, you have lost another multitude to the kingdom of God and you'll never get them back. They belong to Christ. They are yours now, Jesus. And we honor you for your salvation. Lord, as we take up this offering, we give it out of cheerful hearts that have been redeemed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.